Welcome back to TrainSignal Citrix Zen App Training. You're watching Publishing Applications and Content lesson. So this is the lesson everyone's been waiting for. This is the time when we get to install applications, when we get to publish applications and publish content. This is going to be a great lesson. What we're going to talk about is first we're going to start off with understanding applications in remote desktop services. There are some challenges, some requirements, some things you just need to be aware of when you're evaluating an application for remote desktop services candidacy. And whenever I say remote desktop services, it's inevitable, it's imminent that I'm also talking about ZenApp. ZenApp installs on top of remote desktop services. So for an application to work with RDS but not to work with ZenApp would be unlikely, almost impossible. The other way around would be more likely. Applications tend to work better with ZenApp than they would with just remote desktop services for many reasons and we'll discuss. The other thing that we're going to talk about in this lesson is publishing resources type or published resources type. What kind of resources can you publish? Server desktops, applications, what kind of applications, content, what type of content. We're also going to talk about user account access types. You can log in with anonymous user, with defined users. What are the different users that you can log in with? We're then going to focus our attention on server installed applications and how you publish them and the different parameters and what you need to do ahead of time during the process, etc. We'll talk a little bit about installation manager, which is a way for you to automate the installation of applications to a ZenApp server. And then we'll talk about VM hosted applications and the benefits and pros and cons and when you would use VM hosted applications. Now installing applications to an RDS server is not the same as installing applications to a regular server. And the reason for that is terminal services or RDS servers in general are multi-user servers, which means applications have to be written in a certain way to understand multi-user. In order for you to be able to install this application on a server, the server has to be capable of servicing multiple users. Now, in the past, this used to be a, a, you know, a lot more challenging. Applications were very poorly written, and a lot of applications were not written well for remote desktop services. Now, as Microsoft's operating system progressed and the APIs changed and Microsoft started to put in code in there, which almost immediately made the application multi-user aware just because of the, the APIs that the developers are coding to. So in essence, you know, Microsoft almost made the application development a lot better, especially for RDS because of those provisions. However, there still remains applications out there that pose a challenge when installed in an RDS environment and in a ZenApp environment. So I just want you to be aware that when you're installing, when you're evaluating an application and you're going through the installation process, some applications might install very well, very easily, and other applications well, let's just say that it'll give you more of a challenge. You'll have to work a little harder on making sure you're installing it properly in an RDS server. Some other applications that you'll be challenged with are applications that don't know how to create user data isolation, which could potentially pose some kind of a privacy issue for you. So as you're evaluating the application, again, make sure that, you know, if you're going to have 10 sessions on that particular server, that user A's files and data cannot be seen by user B so that the application knows how to properly isolate user data from one another. That's another thing to take a look at for. Device dependencies. Some application will require that certain physical devices be present through the session in order for the application to function properly. Some applications have a need for USB, for COM, for LPT ports, so on and so forth. Be aware that those applications, you would need to map these devices through the session. And that's where ZenApp shines. RDS has a good support for device drivers. ZenApp has great support for device drivers. And ZenApp, it keeps getting better and better with Citrix with every release. They support more and more devices, I can't even think of specific devices that aren't supported through a ZenApp session. So again, with, with ZenApp servers, now you can support these applications that require device dependencies, but again, pay attention to them as you're evaluating the application. However, the most important thing to look at when you're evaluating an application for candidacy on an RDS server is performance. Sometimes the application is so resource intensive, it's not worth putting on an RDS server. Sometimes 
the application requires so many resources that you'll end up saying, okay, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to install this whole infrastructure and I can only put two users or five users. I was in environments where we had applications where we couldn't put more than eight users on a particular Zen app server, no matter what we did, no matter how much hardware we threw at that server, the application was poorly written to a point where no matter how much hardware you're throwing at it, it was taking those resources and the number of users was not going up. This was maybe six or seven years ago with, with applications, you know, in real estate and, and so on and so forth, where no, the hardware wasn't the problem, it was poorly written applications. So take a look at the application, understand the profile of the application. There might be graphic intensive applications that are just not good candidates for RDS servers that might be better candidates for a Zen desktop deployment, for example. And the reason for that is with a Zen app or an RDS server, you have a set of resources that you're sharing across all the users that are connecting to that particular server. So let's say for simplicity reasons, let's just say I have a 4 gig 32 bit Zen app server and you have 20 or 30 or 40 users connecting to this Zen app server. If you have a graphics intensive application, then these users are going to share 4 gig. There's no real way of saying, well, I want user A to have 2 gig of that memory and then all the other users get the remainder. There, there is no way for you to carve that out. As a result, a graphic intensive application would suffer in a Zen app environment, for example. As opposed to if you were to create a Zen desktop virtual machine specifically for that user, well, you're able to customize the performance. You're able to give it more resources on an individualized basis. So you can have user A get four gig of memory, whereas user B will get one gig of memory. So you get more flexibility. So depending on the application, it might be a good candidate here or there. The other thing to look out for, and I've been talking about this, is multi-user compatible applications. So there are different places where you can put information in the registry, right? But there are two main sections as it relates to the applications. There's the HKey local machine and there's HKey current user. Now there are certain applications that were poorly written that will store the application data in HKey local machine. Now that's not very recommended, that's not very desirable in an RDS environment. And the reason for that is if you have user A connecting to this application and this application is poorly written where all the settings are in HK local machine and that user makes a change, then user B that logs into that server will also see the change that user A made. And once user B makes the change, then user A will also see the change. And especially in those situations where the settings are the same, They'll go back and forth on those settings for a while, and I've seen that. So you want to make sure that the application is storing user data or application-specific data on a per-user basis in the right registry key hives. In this case, we want the application to store the data in H key current user so that the user-specific settings that are made to an application do not conflict across users. So these are just basic guidelines, basic things to look out for when you're evaluating applications for an RDS deployment or a Zen app deployment. Published resource types. There are several different resource types that you can publish in a Zen app environment. You can publish a server's desktop. Now server desktops are shared desktops, which means it's not really a, an isolated desktop. It's the same desktop that each user is connecting to it's one server but every user is getting a customized view of that particular desktop so it's not like with a vdi or with you know where you have your own dedicated isolated vm and if you crash that vm then you don't affect anyone with server desktops deployed via zen app if for whatever reason or however way you were able to find it you crash that desktop for yourself then you crashed it for all the other users that are connected to that rds server now, you can also publish applications, and there are different types of applications that you can publish. You can publish server installed applications. Those are ser applications that literally get installed on the operating system and modify it. Then you can also stream applications to Zen app. So you can create sort of like an application virtualization package and deliver that to Zen app where the application is layered on the operating system, but it's not really installed on the operating system. You can also deliver streamed applications to client devices where, again, the application isn't installed on the client operating system. It's layered on top of it, but you're using local resources to run that application. So there's a benefit there as well. Now, you can also publish content. 
you can publish websites you can publish file on a web server if you needed to a direct to an ftp server file etc etc i've listed them all here for you so different types of contents that you can publish through your zen app server you also have different types of user accounts that can get access to published resources you can get what's known as a configured user account now a configured user account requires a username and a password what that provides is accountability but it also provides for personalization so the user is able to you're able to give the user a user profile a collection of his particular his or her particular settings that follow the user that are persistent to the user when they log on to a Zen app server as opposed to anonymous users anonymous users as the name implies are you know a user account that automatically logs into resources now there might be circumstances where anonymous users make sense in all honesty I haven't come across a Zen app environment where we've used anonymous users other than for example if we had a kiosk somewhere uh, with very locked down desktop or a very locked down application that was in a public place and you just wanted anyone to be able to connect to it maybe it makes sense but for the most part it's always been a configured user account now you should note that during the installation of Zen app there are 15 local user accounts local anonymous user accounts that are created on the Zen app server and I'll show you that when we get into the GUI that have guest access now as part of best practices I tend to always delete those 15 accounts immediately that's some of the post installation Zen app things that we'll talk about later that I they always do delete the 15 local user accounts as a security good practice now what about server installed applications installing applications onto a Zen app server is not the same as installing applications onto a regular Windows 2008 R2 server on a Windows R8 or 2008 R2 server you would just take the executable of an application double click on it and run it take office for example you can run office simply by putting the CD double click the auto run go through the installation well it's not the same with RDS now keep in mind we've been saying that RDS is a multi-user server as a result there is a specific installation process that you have to follow in order to tell the user that I'm about to install an application onto you be prepared to you know take advantage of this application and use all the hooks that you have as part of the operating system to make this application multi-user friendly now there are different places within Zen app where you can go to properly install an application the easiest which I'll show you when we get into the GUI is to go to control panel there's an icon or an application there called install applications on remote desktop server once you double click on that it'll bring up a wizard and I'll take you through that you'll install the application that way that's one way of doing it through a GUI very easy very simple another way of doing it is through the command line so using install applications on remote desktop server basically puts the RDS server in the right mode to accept applications now you can do that from a GUI or you can do that from a command line by invoking the command change user forward slash install change user forward slash install puts the Zen app server into install mode that this mode basically tells the server I'm about to install an application onto you now it goes without saying when you're installing an application onto a Zen app server no user should be logged onto that server because it will affect the registry hives that would need to be populated for multi-user compatibility it might affect some of the current H key current user because they're open hives if the user is still connected so you want to make sure there are no users on the server when you're doing this install in order to get the best smoothest install possible now once the installation is complete you can do one of two things you can restart the server and by restarting the server you're putting that server back into execute mode or you can manually put the server back into execute mode when you're done with the installation by invoking the command change user forward slash execute now you should also be aware that there are certain applications that require a mid install reboot which means you install the application and it'll tell you I need to reboot before I can continue the install of the application now what happens in this case you have your server in install mode and the GUI reboots it automatically now it's in execute mode and the installation is continuing well that kind of contradicts what we've been saying server has to always be in install mode when you're installing that application 
So what you would do for mid-install reboots, and we'll talk about that a little more extensively in the GUI, is typically these applications will populate either the run or the run once hive within the registry so that the next time the application comes up or the next time the operating system comes up, the installation continues. What you want to do is clear the registry key in the run once command so that when the operating system reboots, the application doesn't automatically try to continue the installation. Once the OS reboots, put the OS back into install mode and then manually run the command that was in the run once registry hive. And I'll show you, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more extensively when we get into the GUI. Now, another thing to, to pay attention to that, that could be very, very useful in your Zen app installation or RDS installation for that matter, Microsoft makes available an RDS application analyzer. So while you can manually try to install applications and, and you could try to figure out if these applications are good candidates to be installed on ZenApp or RDS server, you can also use the RDS application analyzer, which will run certain tests against the executable or the MSI of that particular application and tell you if this application is a good candidate for installation on an RDS server. And if it's not a good candidate, if the tool can find a particular fix that you can use to make this application work in RDS. So the tool not only tells you if it'll work or not, it'll also suggest certain fixes if they're available. If the application is aware of certain fixes, it'll make those recommendations so that you can have a smoother install of this application on an RDS box. VM hosted applications. This is really cool. Up until recently, there was applications that just didn't install on server platforms. So you had applications that would, would require a guest operating system that only worked on Windows XP, for example, or Windows 7, or Windows 95, I don't know. But they needed a guest operating system. That same application, even though the kernel between Windows XP and Windows 2003 is extremely similar, that application would still not install. This posed a dilemma because now you had to maintain Windows XP machines to provide access to these applications. So what Citrix did with Zen App 6 is now you can have a Windows XP machine and you can publish an application from that Windows XP machine to users. Now here's the caveat, here's the catch. Windows XP is not a terminal server. So while you can publish an application from Windows XP, only one user at a time can access that application. So if you have an application and you need to give 10 users concurrent access to it, you would need 10 instances, 10 VDI instances of Windows XP and you publish the application through them. Now the question is, why wouldn't you use Zen Desktop? Now, well, that's a good question. But if you don't have a Zen Desktop infrastructure and your use case is limited or small, then it might not be worth deploying a Zen desktop infrastructure just to be able to get this functionality and it would make more sense to use VM hosted applications and create those VMs, publish them through Zen app rather than deploy an entire infrastructure just for 10 users. Now with regards to VM hosted applications, the components needed are a desktop delivery controller otherwise known as a DDC and the two management consoles that you'll need are VM hosted apps console and the delivery services console and you also need the virtual desktop agent the VDA is what is that particular software that gets installed on the Windows XP for example instance itself that allows it to communicate with a desktop delivery controller now for those of you that know Zen desktop you're probably saying well Eli you know you know if we're gonna do all of this we might as well just deploy Zen desktop because we're 60 percent there we're already deploying the desktop delivery controller and we're deploying the virtual desktop agent so that's true, but again, you'll have to weigh the differences when it's time to do this, whether or not it's worth investing in all of that time and effort in order to make the environment Zen desktop ready or just do it for a limited number of users. All right, let's switch over to the demo and start doing things. On our Zen app server, we've downloaded WinRAR and we're going to use that as a demo application to, to showcase how we're going to install and publish applications through Zenap. So in order to install WinRAR, you can just double click on it. 
this is not a normal Windows 2008 R2 server. You can't just double click on it in an RDS server as we talked about in the presentation. So what you would have to do is one of two things. You can always go to control panel and there is a GUI interface that allows you to properly install applications on remote desktop services. So what I want to do here is change the categories so I can see it better. And there you go. Now you have install application on remote desktop. So if I click on that, it's going to start a GUI or it's going to start a wizard here. If I go through, click next, and you'll notice that it's also already explaining what is RD install mode. So what it's, what it's doing now is it's putting the server in install mode. So if I click on browse and I find the executable on my desktop, this would be one of the correct ways of installing WinRAR on my particular RDS server. So I'm going to change here the programs to all files. If I select that, if I click on open and go through with the installation, then it will properly put the server into install mode, install the application, then when it's done, it will put the server back into execute mode. Now this is one of the reasons, or this is one of the ways, and let's go ahead and install it using this particular application. Now it put it into install mode and then it automatically initiated the wizard that allows you to install the application. Notice it's still open in the background. I'm going to go ahead and install it. We're not going to do anything specific or special here. We're just going to accept all the defaults for this application. Now, once it's installed, you're going to click on finish and voila. The server is now back into execute mode. Now, what is the other way of putting the server back into execute mode? You are correct. It would be to reboot that particular server. Now, what is another way of putting the server into install mode? Well, so the other way would be to open up a command prompt and type change user forward slash install. This properly puts the server into install mode. Once it's in install mode, go ahead and double click on it at this point. The normal way you would, it would go through the whole process. Once it's installed, once it's done, once you're ready to put it back into execute mode, again, it's either you're rebooting the server or you're putting a forward slash execute after change user and it puts the server back into execute mode at this point. Now again, and I want to stress this, it goes without saying that when you're doing all of this, the server should not have any users that are connected to it. That is very important. Now we also talked about applications that require a mid-install reboot. And we talked about how some applications will populate certain registry keys in order to allow the application to continue after the server has been rebooted. So what you want to do for these applications, let's just assume that for whatever reason, WinRAR needed a mid-install reboot. So you install it portions of the application, got to the point that said, I can't continue, I need a reboot. If you reboot it, the server is back into execute mode and the server or the application is going to kick in and start installing automatically. You don't want that. You want to stop that. Now, the way to stop that is to go into the registry key where the application places that statement or puts a statement which instructs it to restart the installation process when the OS reboots. And typically, if we go to start run here, let's go ahead and open the registry, go into regedit. If you go to H key local machine, we're going to go to software and then we're going to go to Microsoft. I'm going to go to Windows. We're going to go to current version. And we're going to drag down to where it says run and run once. Now, those are the two registry hives that the applications might use in order to store that statement that would automatically force the application to restart the installation or to continue the installation process after a reboot. Now, what's the difference? The run once command, typically this is a, a statement or this is a, a location in the registry where applications will put a statement that will run only once. So the re server reboots, it runs once, after it runs it will automatically delete that statement and this, this hive will always be empty. The other hive which is run always has applications or processes or services that always run when the operating system is rebooted. So that's the only difference between these two is this is a temporary once and the other one is just constantly. It'll always run once the operating system reboots. So what you want to do with the install reboots is you come in here, copy the statement into a notepad for example. and 
you can then reboot the server. The server will automatically come back into execute mode, put the server back into install mode, and then take that statement from the notepad where you copied it and manually invoke it. So if it's just pointing to another executable with some parameters after that executable, just open up a command prompt and run it manually with the correct parameters after the executable file, which will run that application as if it was in the run once registry hive. That's how you get around mid install reboots for particular applications that are coded that way. All right, so now that we've installed our application, let's go ahead and publish it. And in order to publish it, what we're going to do is we're going to bring up the delivery services console. We are going to expand our farm. And you'll notice I have an applications node here. What I'm going to do with that is right click. We're going to publish application and this gets the or kickstarts the wizard for publishing applications and resources. I'm going to click on next. We're going to give this a name. So I'm going to stick with WinRAR, for example. Feel free to give it a description. At this point, I'm just going to do WinRAR for both. And this is where you can configure the type of resource that you're trying to publish. If it was just publishing a, a desktop, then you would select it. It would remove or gray out the remainder of the screen. If it was content, again, the next steps, the next wizard will take you through and we'll go through that in a second. But if it's applications, then you have the option of selecting, well, what type of an application is it? Is it an installed application on the ZenApp server? And is it? Yeah, because we just installed it on the ZenApp server. Now, the other options that you have here, streamed to server. So you've already configured your application as a streamed application and all you want to do is deliver it to the Zen app server you would choose that particular option we're going to cover that in the next lesson which is streaming applications so I'm not going to spend too much time on streamed applications here we're going to click on installed applications and you'll notice down here I have stream to client so if you're trying to stream a particular application to the client you would select this option again we're going to cover this in greater detail in the next lesson so I'm going to keep it at that we're going to click on next now the uh, you need to specify the application path. Where is this application installed? Now here's something that's very important. You have to install the application in the same place on all the ZenApp servers that are going to support this application. In other words, if you've decided that, okay, I'm going to bring up five ZenApp servers and I want these five ZenApp servers to supply WinRAR as a published applications to my users. As a result, you cannot install WinRAR on the C drive of ZenApp 1 and then install it on the D drive of ZenApp 2. If you're going to install it on the C drive, it has to be on the C drive. It has to be the same directory, same path, same folder structure. So what we're going to do now is we're going to browse to the executable that actually runs WinRAR. We'll click on Browse. We're going to go to Program Files. We're going to scroll down here. And we're going to select WinRAR. And then I'm going to select the actual executable, which is, in my case, winrar.exe. We're going to click on Open. This specifies the path, and this specifies the working directory. These have to match on every ZenApp server. That's very important. Once you're ready, you're going to click on Next. At this point, you're going to select the servers that are going to participate in servicing this application. So if this application was to be spread over a number of servers, this is where you would choose that. We're going to click on Add. And over here, you can select the entire work group so that every server you add into the work group automatically will service this application. Or you can specify or find the applications individually if you wanted to. So if you go to servers, you'll see that I have a folder. In that folder, I have ZenApp01. I can add that. And then only ZenApp01 is added to this particular application or services this application. However, what I want to do is select the entire work group and my work group is called CRM servers. So now every time I add a new server into CRM servers work groups, it will automatically be part of the servers that are servicing this particular application. Click on OK and click on Next. And here's where you can specify which users are going to have access to this application. Again, if you select allow anonymous users, then you don't have to select anything because you already have 15 user accounts that are created by default during the installation of ZenApp. Whereas if you select allow only configured users, then you have to go in and specify which users 
you want to give access to. So let's say I go into ncom.local. It's going to prompt me to authenticate to the domain. I have a container called Citrix, and in that container I have users. And let's go ahead and deploy this to the read-only users. This is, a, this is a global group that I want to publish this application to. This is, again, we've covered this before. This is a way for you to select the users that you want to configure on a particular ZenApp server. We've done that with the administrators. If you select operating system selector, this will bring up the local browser. So it'll bring up the local users that are available on this particular computer. And you can do that that way. So we don't want to select any local user groups at this point. I'm going to key, stick with the domain. We're going to click on next. Here you're able to customize some of the application settings. Now, I don't want to go through this at this point because we're going to go into the properties of the applications and we're going to go through all of it. However, if you wanted to change the icon that is displayed to the users for this particular application, you can always click on change icon, point to a different path if you wanted to, or select some of the icons that are readily available to you. So you can always choose the icon that is displayed to the users. Once we talk in the next lessons about how you deliver the applications to ZenApp clients or the ZenApp plugins, this is basically a way for you to customize if you're delivering the applications to the start menu. Do you want to organize Citrix applications in a folder on the start menu of every user? Do you want to put them on the desktop? This allows you to tweak how this particular icon is delivered from a user device perspective. We're going to keep all these at defaults at this time and we're going to click on next. You can select to create the application, but you might, in some cases, you don't want to necessarily make it available right away. So you can create it, but disable the application, or you can configure advanced application settings now. I don't want to do either, so I'm going to click on finish because I just wanted to publish the application at this point. And as you can see, the application is now published and it's available. So again, you can create folders here and organize the applications the way you want. So if you had you know, a particular application that maybe has a lot of databases, you can always create the, a folder and, and group those applications that are of similar types. If you're publishing the Microsoft Office Suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, you can create a Microsoft Office folder. Now keep in mind, the organization that you do here, the folders that you create here are not the same folders that the user is going to see when they connect through the Citrix receiver or the plugin, the online plugin or the offline plugin. Those are configured somewhere else and we're going to talk about those. Now, once you've configured, once you've published an application, you can always modify the properties of that application in order to further tweak it. So let's see what else we can do with this published application. I'm going to go ahead and right click on it. And then we're going to drag down to application properties. And let's go through the different options that we have here. The name, we went through that. You're able to create, you know, give it a name, give it a description. If you wanted to disable the application, you could do that. You can also hide disabled applications. So a disabled application is still going to show up for the user, except they can't click on it. Now, if you want to avoid confusion, if you're disabling an application, you might as well hide it, right? That way the user never sees the application, never knows it's there. There's no problem. You don't get another phone call. Now, you also have a description for the application. So the difference here is just it's more information about this application. The display name is what the end user is going to see. So you can name this whatever you want. The application name is the real name of the application. And then you have the application description. So you're probably asking, well, why do I need an application name and a display name? Shouldn't they be the same? Well, not necessarily. In some instances, in some organizations, users are used to calling an application maybe by a, a common name or a known name or a feature set of that application where that name doesn't necessarily relate to the application. So what you end up having to do is naming the application by what the user can identify it with, but you want to continue to know what the application's real name is. So you need a way of you know making sure you, you preserve your sanity. So you put the real name of the application here and then you give it a description if you choose to do so. Now the type, once you've created a particular type of an application, you can't change it. You'd have to delete the application 
and then re-add it, republish it. Now keep in mind, when you delete the application from the Delivery Services Console, that doesn't uninstall it. You're just logically removing that particular object from your Zen App Farm, and you'd have to go through the publishing process all over again. You can change the location of where the server or where the executable is, so that's where you can do that. You can serve with you can change, add, remove which servers are supporting this application. You can change which users have access to this application. You can configure user groups or you can configure users individually here. And then you can control the shortcut presentation. Now I'm not going to spend too much time on this because in later lessons we're going to spend significant time talking about the online plugins and the different plugins that Citrix has to offer. But I just want to make sure I cover it in general. So this is where you can control what the icon looks like from the user's perspective. Now when we start talking about the different plugins that the user can install on a Windows machine or a Mac or any of their devices, these plugins have an interface. Now you can deliver the applications, the published applications, to the interface on the Citrix plugin. And if you do that, this is where you can come in and specify how you want to organize these applications. So if on the online plugin you wanted to organize a user's published content into folders, then you can come here and say, for example, I want to do this as part of Citrix backslash tools. So that WinRAR will show up on the online plugin, for example, or the Citrix receiver inside of a folder called Citrix backslash tools. Now you can take it one step further. If you're using certain clients, certain plugins of ZenApp, and you want it to push applications down to the start menu so that from a user's perspective, they can't tell the difference of whether or not this application is installed locally or if this application is delivered via Citrix, what you would do is you are creating a folder here that you can put this application in. So when the user logs in, they click on Start, Programs, Microsoft Office, and they're seeing all of the Office applications, they don't know if it's installed on Citrix or if it's installed locally until they actually launch it and they'll see the session trying to connect. But otherwise, from a user perspective, it looks the same. Now, if you also want, and obviously you can specify the folder here, backslash, whatever you want. If you wanted to push this to the user's desktop, then you can obviously select this checkbox that allows you to make the application icon show up on the user's desktop. For now, I'm going to keep both of these options disabled and click on the second option here, which is advanced. Now the advanced section, you'll notice you have the basic section and this, these are all the things under it and you have the advanced section. Now under advanced, we can take a look at access control. Now at this screen, you can configure certain criteria which would allow users based on a set of circumstances to connect to an application. So what you're doing here is you're basically saying, I am allowing connections made through Access Gateway to connect to this published application. Now, if I uncheck this, what you're basically saying is that anyone connecting from outside of my network, I don't want them to be able to launch this published application. And you might want to do that for security reasons. Now, if you keep this checked, but you want to configure the criteria. What you're doing in this case is you're saying, I'm allowing connections from inside or outside. Basically, you're saying, I'm allowing any connection. But if you want to further filter that, then you can select the second option here. And then you can select a set of rules, a set of criteria that allows or disallows access to this application. For example, you can select from an access gateway farm. So you can, in your environment, you might have a set of different access gateways that the user is coming through. So if you had an access gateway farm for high security and an access gateway farm for everybody else, and this particular application, you want to allow access to it from the access gateway, but you only want it for users that have high security clearance, then you would select the access gateway farm with the high security clearance availability and select it down here. Now you don't have, we, we haven't configured any access gateways, so they won't show up. But if, if we did, they would show up in this list and you could select that and give them access only so that if user other users are coming in through access gateway, they wouldn't be able to connect if they don't meet this criteria. And then you can place a filter on that as well. So you can specify which farm that you're willing to accept connections from and you can further do filterize that. So they would need to meet certain requirements 
even through that access gateway farm before you're willing to give them access. Now this is again, if you're trying to get very, very granular, this is typically used in very high secure environments where you're literally trying to connect access to certain applications. Now, once you configure a set of rules here, you can specify allow all other connections or if you uncheck this, then what you're saying is basically you're not allowing all other connections. They have to meet this specific requirements or nobody's passing through. So I'm going to keep this at any connection at this point and we're going to keep this checked. Now let's move on to content redirection. Now remember there are two types of content redirection that you can do with ZenApp. You can do what's known as a client to server content redirection or you can do a server to client redirection. Now what this is going to focus on right here is client to server content redirection. So what we're doing here is we're allowing the published application to launch any time a particular file type is associated with it. So let me give you another example. So let's say you were publishing Microsoft Word instead of WinRAR in our example to a user that doesn't have Word installed locally on their device. However, they have Word documents that they've acquired on their USB drive or off of the network somewhere and they want to be able to open these Word files. Now, if you configure content redirection here to allow for dot doc and dot docs, then as soon as that user double clicks on that particular file type, it's going to use the published application word to launch that file and give the user access to it. Now that's beautiful because now you can give your users devices that don't have applications on them, but their files still function. Now there's an extra step to get this to work which I'll show you as soon as we're out of this wizard. So as soon as you click on show all available file types for this application, it's going to enumerate here and you can select which file types you want to associate with this application. Now the way this works is as soon as the user authenticates on their device to the online plugin, the online plugin is going to enumerate all the file types available through the published applications and it's going to load those file types inside of the registry of that particular user and that's how the operating system understands that look if you have a .doc file I want you to associate that .doc file with the published application word it's really cool I'll show you how to do that in just a second here now moving on to limits limits are important because they allow you in one way or another to enforce licensing if I may say so. So for example, let's say you have an expensive application like the Adobe Creative Suite and you only have five licenses of that Adobe Creative Suite. However, you have a hundred users that might want to access it, but you only have five licenses. So if you select limit instances allowed to run in server farm and you specify five, then even though you have a hundred users that want to access it, you are locking down that application so there's only five instances of that application running in the server farm at any given time so user number six wants to try to launch that application it's gonna give them a warning or an error that says you know you can't connect at this time try later so only five instances can run at the same time now you can lock this down further and I actually recommend this allow only one instance of application for each user so there's no reason for one user for example to be able to launch two instances of Adobe Photoshop one instance is enough and this is you know this could be true for a lot of other applications it just doesn't have to be for an expensive application it could be for any other application because it saves on resources otherwise users are going to have three instances of word running and four instances of Excel and this will just confuse them and cause more headaches and more help desk calls so this is actually a good setting here now application importance what you can do here is specify how important this particular application is and you have high normal and low the higher the importance the more access to physical resources this application will have so it'll have priority access to the CPU and the memory and the disk etc etc so the application is prioritized as more important thereby it gets better and more access to the physical resources as such it will enable that application to run much much better so we're gonna keep these this at default and then we're gonna move on to client options here now some of these options I'm gonna talk about later when we talk about security so we'll focus on enabling SSL and TLS but this is primarily how you will be able to enable that for a particular application the encryption level here again we're gonna talk about that later but you can select that from the drop-down menu and when we cover printers we'll talk a little more in depth on 
you know, what this option means. But in, in very, if I was to summarize it real quick, what you're saying is, look, give me access to my application before you enumerate the printer. So I don't want to have to wait for all the printers to be mapped before I get access to my application. Certain applications will, will need access to legacy audio. So if the application requires audio, you might want to enable that. If it doesn't, you probably want to disable it. So these, this controls the audio settings for a particular application. Now, if we move on to the appearance, this screen is a little confusing because realistically, you are publishing seamless applications. And what seamless applications mean is that you're only publishing the shell of the application. You don't see everything else that the application uh, or how it's constructed. So Citrix Zen app will, will masquerade the application and only give you access to its shell. So you'll only see the application as if it were running locally. You won't see the other components that make up that particular session. These settings here refer to the session. If you're publishing a desktop, then these would come into play. But if you're publishing an application, then these really don't come into play because what happens is when you're publishing an application in a seamless mode, the application is going to, or the Zen app is going to understand that this application needs to open with these dimensions and it's going to open it exactly as if it would when the application is installed and running locally. So these don't matter when you're publishing app seamless applications. They come into play if you're publishing something like a published desktop. So let's assume you're publishing a published desktop. You're able to configure how you want that particular published desktop to look on the client device. You can force it into certain dimensions. You can make um, custom dimensions if you want to. You can have it as a percent of the client's desktop so that if the client's desktop is a 21 inch monitor or if it's a 15 inch monitor, it doesn't matter. It's always going to be opening at 75% of that screen. Again, for the purposes of our demonstration and publishing of applications, this is not going to matter. Of course, if you're doing published uh, desktop and you do full screen, you also can do that. So let's go back and keep this at 1024 by 768. And this is um, how rich do you want the colors to be? Do you want to give the user a very rich experience? Well, what are you trying to do here? Now, the more color depth you give the user, obviously the better the user experience, but that comes at the expense of more bandwidth and possibly a lower user experience in the form of maybe the screen is lagging or it's not refreshing or updating frequently. If you're on the LAN, you're fine. If the application is going to cross the WAN, depending on the bandwidth and a lot of other circumstances, you might want to tweak the depth of the application. 16-bit color might be more than enough and might be able to give the user the rich experience that they're looking for and it will be a better and faster experience because when the screen is refreshing it doesn't have to refresh all of these bits and colors so again depending on the circumstances you might want to tweak this now this again isn't going to be or is not come come into effect when you're using a seamless application however when you're using a published desktop you'll be able to hide the application title bar or maximize that desktop at startup. So again, keep in mind here, some settings are going to be for published applications, others might be for published desktops, and they'll take effect one way or another. So let's go ahead and click on OK. And that's it for the advanced properties of the application. Now what I want to do is remind you of, we, we, I mentioned that we we're going to talk about content redirection and how to make these file types visible or make them appear within the published application. Now it's a little hidden so what I want to do here is I want to expand servers and I want to expand the folder that we have it in. Right click on our XA01 server, go down to other tasks and you'll notice here that it says update file types from registry. So as soon as I click on this what it's going to do is it's going to take all the file types that are available in the registry and it's going to load them up into the published application. So if I select that and then we go back into the application here, right click on WinRAR, and let's go back into application properties, and let's go to content redirection. Let's go ahead and check this box and see what happens. And voila, now you have access to all the file types that could potentially be associated with this application. Now you can select all, you can select some of them, whatever you choose to do here. And you can scroll and see whichever ones you want to unselect, for example, or deselect, etc., etc. Now, what happens is, for example, you've selected RAR. Any RAR file, any .zip file, any of these extensions that are available or any files that the user has on their device that doesn't have an associated application, even if the application isn't installed, they will automatically launch with WinRAR. 
So this makes it significantly easier now to extend access or extend support to these files that you typically couldn't if there wasn't a support application installed on the local device. I'm going to go ahead and click OK to get out of here. All right, so let's go ahead and publish content now. So I'm going to go through the same process. We're going to right-click Applications. We're going to click on Publish Application. We're going to get the wizard started. And this time we're going to publish CNN to our users. I'm going to click on Next, and we're going to select Content this time for the application or the publishing type. And the way to specify now, when we were talking during the presentation, I told you that there's a number of content types that you can publish. You can publish websites, you can publish files, you can publish folders, you can you can publish a lot of things. You can publish FTP files and FTP servers. So you can publish a lot of things through content. And the way to specify what you're trying to publish is, you know, if you do a whack whack backslash backslash, that means you are publishing something via a UNC path to a file. If you're publishing like me, CNN, that means you're publishing a web page. You have to specify the way, the way to tell it that this is a web page is with HTTP or HTTPS. That is the trigger which tells it this is a website. You couldn't use www.cnn.com only. It would give you a warning. So by specifying HTTP, then you're telling it that I'm publishing a web content type. Now, if you wanted to publish files or any other thing on the, on the network, you can click on Browse and Browse to those particular files. In this example, we're just going to publish a website. And you know, this might be a good idea of how to use anonymous users. You know, you, maybe you just want to publish this to everyone and you don't really need them to log in because you're not tracking who's going to CNN.com. You might publish it via anonymous users. So just for the purposes of this example, I don't recommend this, but just for the purposes of this example and going through the wizard a little quicker, we're going to select anonymous users. This is the icon that it's giving now to Internet Explorer. I'm going to keep all of these at defaults. I'm going to click on Next. You can disable it if you choose to do so. Otherwise, you can click on Finish, and voila. Now you have this configured with anonymous users. Now, if you wanted to change that, again, right-click on it, come down here to Advanced Properties, and you can click on Users. And let's go ahead and configure this with our users just for consistency sake. And we're going to give it to the read only again. Click on OK and bada bing, bada boom, you're done. Now, one final thing to publish just uh, so we have all of them. We're going to right click again, go to published applications. We're going to click on next. And this time we are going to publish the community desktop. This is a shared desktop that you give to all of your users that need it and that has a bunch of applications on that particular desktop. To do that, we're going to select on server desktop, click on next. Which servers do you want to give this access to? I'm going to select this particular work group. I'm going to go through, we're going to go through the same exercise here. We're going to go through Encom and we're going to authenticate. Go to Citrix, and let's give it to Help Desk this time. We're going to give them a little more access. And keep everything at default. This is the icon. I'm fine with that. And voila. Now let's take a look at what else I can do with this application. Now, if you select the application, you'll notice that you know it splits the screen and gives you more information about this particular application. You can browse the configured users the current settings on the application. So it gives you a little bit of a quick snapshot of what's going on on that particular application. On the right here, it gives you quick access to do certain tasks quickly. So you can save this application in my views if you want to. Uh, you can create folder, publish applications, etc. There are other tasks that you can do. You can select permissions, import new application from a file. I'll talk about that in a second. But you can also disable the application if you wanted to put it into maintenance. You can duplicate the application. Now, duplicating the application sometimes is an easier way of, if you're installing or if you're publishing a lot of applications, you don't always want to go through the wizard and configure the same settings. If the application is going to have most of the same settings as an, an application that's already published. So, for example, if you have, if you're publishing another application, 
that the same users that use WinRAR and the same servers that WinRAR is installed on are going to be on, then what you could do is you might as well duplicate WinRAR and then modify the application properties of the copy, change the name, change the path to the executable, and you're done. You don't have to configure the servers again. You don't have to configure the users again. So it's just shortcut to save you a little bit of time uh, on how to get you know things done quicker. You can move the application into specific folders if you wanted to in order to uh, obviously organize it. You can delete the application. That's pretty self-explanatory. We went through the application properties and you can rename it. This is a quick way of renaming the application by selecting it here. Now there are also other tasks that you can do. These are all of the tasks that we've covered some of them for the most part. Change the application type, publish a new application, attach application to a load evaluator. So if you wanted this application to be part of a load evaluator, and we'll talk about load evaluators in, in later lessons, so I don't want to spend too much time on it here. But this allows it to participate in, well, at what point do you, re you redirect users to other servers? The load evaluator will focus more on how to determine when there's a lot of load on a particular application. Now for backup reasons maybe or for documentation reasons you might want to export the application into a file. Now why why would you want to do that? As we've said before the farm is heavily reliant on the database. If for whatever reason you lose the database in your Zen app the only way would be for you to go ahead and recreate all of your settings, publish all of your applications again. Well, if you're exporting the applications to files, then if you lose the farm database, you can come back in and import those files that you've exported. So over here we talked about, well, how do I import an application from a file? Well, first you need to have that file. And the way to have that file is to export in the first place, and that gives you an option to import that particular file. So if you wanted to have some documentation, some backup redundancy for this application, you can also right-click it if you want to, drag down to other tasks, and what we're going to do here is we're going to export this application, either the entire application or only the user list or the server list. Now, why would you want to do that? Again, sometimes depending on how you want to re-import this application, you might not want to import everything. You might want to just import the users that are configured on this application or the servers that are associated with this application. Import that section only into another app that's already existent. But for the most part, if you do entire application, you can specify a name for it. Let's do WinRAR2 and let's click on Save. Now we've exported this application, or the application files, basically, to the desktop. Now, in the event that you know your farm crashes, whatever, but you have a collection of these files saved somewhere, you come back and you obviously have to reinstall the application, but the publishing process becomes easier. You can click on other tasks, come down here to where it says import, and now if you select it off of the desktop, there you go. Copy of WinRAR. Now it's obviously giving us an error. So let's go ahead and examine what the problem is, where it's saying could not import server or CRM servers. Now, the reason it could not do that is the export file probably doesn't understand the concept of worker groups. So I'm willing to bet if we click on ignore and continue, well, now we have a copy of WinRAR. If we right click on it now again and go down to application properties, and go to servers, it's obviously going to be empty because it doesn't understand the concept of worker groups. Now you can add worker group, the worker group again manually. However, let's try this test a different way. Let's go ahead and remove this and let's add the servers this time, not from a worker group, but rather from servers directly. Let's go into CRM and do just XA01 and click on OK. So now let's go back and export copy of WinRAR. So I'm going to right click and we are going to drag down to where it says other tasks and we're going to export this entire application. And this time we're going to call this copy of WinRAR or let's just do WinRAR 3. I'm going to click on OK or save. And let's go ahead and import it now. <laughs> 
There you go. This time it imported it. Now, why is that? Now, if I told you this was a bug, would you guys believe me? Because this is. So what, what, what's happening here is when you're exporting, typically when Citrix put this functionality in, the export process didn't account for worker groups. The concept of worker groups didn't exist prior to ZenApp 6. So some of the functionality doesn't understand worker group. So when you went to re-import that application, it showed nothing in the servers group because it didn't understand worker group. So pay attention to what happens here. And you can notice that you can't even export a worker group. Uh, it's not even an option for you to export it. Now, the other option here is refresh user data. What happens is sometimes you're looking at an application and you're looking at the usage and you're seeing all of the users connected to this application, but you want a more updated list of users that are connected or more updated metrics on this particular application. So what you can do is just refresh the data on this application and then you're viewing the most up-to-date information available to you. So now that we've created all of these applications, what I want to do is clean them up a little bit. So we're going to start by deleting these applications, making our um, farm clean again. So we're just going to use the delete button here. And you can most certainly select more than one application at a time and delete it. I'm just being a little lazy. And great job, Eli. You deleted the desktop as well, but that's okay. We, <laughs> we'll probably recreate it again during the course. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here is when we're going through the publishing wizard, I told you we would, at the end, I'm going to show you how you can enable the policy for server to client redirection of content. So let's go ahead and select policies. And we're going to select user policies here. And let's go ahead and open our unfiltered policy. We're going to just do an edit on it. And we're going to click on next. Now we're going to select file redirection. You see here where it says host to client redirection. What I want to do is I want to click on edit. And now we have that enabled by default because when we we're going through the Citrix policies, we enabled that. However, this would technically might not be enabled. So you probably want to come in here and enable it. Now you'll notice down here, it's telling you what types of content you can redirect so that if you're publishing them and the user actually clicks on them, it won't open at the server level. It'll redirect to local resources. So for example, anything with hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP would be open locally. Secure HTTP, the same thing. Real player and QuickTime, legacy real players, Microsoft media format, etc., etc. So these are the types every time the, if you publish them and the user clicks on them, it won't open at the server. It'll redirect to the client. We'll click on OK here. Since we haven't made any changes, I'm not going to save it. But I just wanted to show you where in the policies just in case that lesson wasn't gruesome enough, <laughs> where in the policies you can go to enable that. All right, I'm going to switch back now to our presentation so that we can recap what we've learned. Is it safe to assume you guys enjoyed this lesson? <laughs> I sure did. This is one of my favorite lessons to record. All right, so let's recap what we learned. We started off by talking about the need to understand the applications in RDS. How certain applications might not be good candidates in RDS because of performance reasons, maybe because of privacy reasons, maybe because the application wasn't built or configured for multi-user and it stores the, the application settings in HK local machine which would confuse the application because each user that's logging on can manipulate the changes and the others will see those changes. Maybe some of the applications pose an installation problem. So during the installation, it's not going to go very smoothly and you have to tweak and turn in order to get the, the application to install properly. So we talked about a lot of things that you need to watch out for when you're evaluating an application for RDS installation. We then moved on to talk about the different published resources types that are available. We talked about server desktops. We talked about applications and how you have streamed applications to Zenapps, streamed applications to clients, how you have published applications which are installed applications on the actual Zenapp server. We talked about the different user account access types and how you have configured and defined users that need a username and password and which you're able to create user profiles against as opposed to anonymous users, which are automatically configured and created during the installation of Zenapp. There's 15 of them. They're given guest access and some of their use cases. 
We then moved on to talk about server installed applications. How you need, to, you need to take good care when you're installing an application on a Zen App server. And it's not just as simple as double clicking an executable and going through the installation. You have to either use the install applications on remote desktop services wizard through control panel or invoke command line change user forward slash install to install the application and then put it back into execute mode either by via a reboot or change user forward slash execute we talked about mid install reboots and how you can get around uh, some of these we talked about the need for users not to be logged on to a Zen app server when you're doing the installation now with regards to installation manager installation manager is it's like SMS or System Center Configuration Manager where it's a it's a packaging tool that allows you to package these applications and deliver them to a ZenApp server for installation. So it's like publishing an application in an automated fashion. Now Citrix hasn't been putting a lot of emphasis on this type of application deployment to ZenApp servers. They've been focusing more on streaming the applications to ZenApp server and this tool we didn't demo the tool just because it's a little outside of the scope and there's not a lot of highlight on it so there was no really need to go through the complicated process of using installation manager we then talked about VM hosted applications and how certain applications will just not install on server class operating systems and how they require a guest operating system in order to install like Windows XP or Windows 7 or Windows 95 and how there's a need sometimes to make to centralize some of these applications and make them available to users and one of the ways is to bring up a Windows XP machine put the necessary software on it and then publish an application from that guest operating system with the caveat that you can only connect one user so one user to every desktop so if you need 10 concurrent you would need 10 desktops in order to give access to these applications finally i hope this lesson was very informative for you and i'd like to thank you for viewing